If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And there are our worksheets back there if you didn't get a worksheet coming in. If you need one of those, Lonnie's standing right there. He'll get it for you. And tonight I want to talk to you about believing is seeing. And the opposite of this is seeing is believing. I've heard that all my life. All right, seeing is believing. But I want to go from the spiritual realm of what we uh, are talking about tonight. Believing is seeing. And if you look on your outline, number one, the fear of persecution. The fear of persecution. Number two, the filling of the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit. And number three, faith instead of fear. Faith instead of fear. And uh, it, it was one of my devotions, always been about a month ago, and they used the word seeing is believing. And I don't know, that just stuck with me. And the more I pondered on that, I came up with believing is seeing in the text uh, that we are looking at tonight. Uh, you know, immediately after Jesus' resurrection, he appeared, he appeared to Mary. Mary told the disciples that she had just seen Jesus. Word began to spread around about Jesus being alive, but many, including the disciples, were not sure it was true. They wanted to believe the good news, but still wanted to see Jesus in person. Jesus was about to uh, uh, pay his disciples a visit. Everyone, now listen to this, everyone who truly has an encounter with God or Jesus, their lives are never the same. This is especially true with Jesus' closest friends, the disciples. Proof of the doubting was that Peter and John did go to the empty tomb of Jesus, but didn't say much about it to others. Let's look at Jesus' first encounter with his disciples post-resurrection. So in John chapter 20, starting in verse 19, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, and again, this you know, this is Sunday night, uh, post-resurrection. When the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be with you. And here we are seeing, uh, you know, the human side of the disciples. And when you think of Peter, Peter was the spokesperson. Uh, Peter was the one that, you know, uh, even when they were arresting Jesus, you know, he, he whips out a sword and does his thing. And so, you know, Peter was the one that said, you know, when Jesus was talking to the disciples, you know, whether anybody else follows you, I'll follow you and I'll die with you. And all this goes on. And yet Peter, at the fire, we all know, uh, you know, denied Christ three times. And so there's this doubt that comes into their lives. And when we look at the word here, the, the, the word I want you to see in this first part is when the disciples were, were assembled, for fear of the Jews. See, the fear was they saw what happened to Jesus. Okay, They saw the crucifixion and all that went on there. And they were basically behind closed doors is what the Word of God tells us because they were fearing for their own lives. And you can see here, and you'll see twice that phrase, peace be with you. Okay, And Jesus is just trying to assure them that everything was going to be all right. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us uh, 365 times, do not fear. Do not fear. Uh, there were many times in illustrations and even in the preaching of Jesus, and we know three times, uh, different times in the Gospels, uh, he told them uh, when the storms come up in life, not to fear. So, I mean, he spent, you know, most of his ministry, the three years, pouring that into the disciples. But yet, when, when things got tough, all right, when Jesus was crucified, uh, they were hiding in fear. And folks, the bottom line is, we as Christians should not be in fear. We should not be afraid of anything. And I know any survey or any book or anything I've ever read on the number one fear in life is the fear of death. 
And to a Christian, I'm telling you folks, it's graduation day. We should not fear uh, death because the Bible tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So they were fearing, and, and uh, you can see later on, uh, they had learned their lesson. Uh, hold your finger there and, and look in Acts chapter 4 with me. Acts chapter 4, just go ahead a little ways. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. The Bible says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, un untrained men, they marveled. And you remember what was happening was a man was healed. Peter looked over basically and said, Silver and gold have I none, but in the name of Jesus Christ, you rise up and walk. And he walked. And uh, man, the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, you know, they got a hold of it. Then the Sanhedrin got a hold of it. And they were just saying, you know, who, who, you know, who is Peter? You know, why is this happening? You know, we all, I mean, they all had seen this, this guy lame from birth outside, and they all knew that there was a miracle that happened. And basically, they were wanting to know what was going on, and they knew who Peter and John and they were also. They were fishermen. And this, this, is, this sentence just amazed me. Uh, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Folks, people that we run into, people that we are around, should be able, and, and again, I'm just throwing a, a number out there, should be able within five or ten minutes of speaking to you or talking to you, know that you had been with Jesus. All right? And the disciples were, you know, that post-resurrection, you know, uh, you know they, they were scared and they were afraid. But, the, you know, the Holy Spirit, which I'm going to talk about here in just a few minutes, that Holy Spirit is what gives us the boldness. And that's what they were, the Sanhedrin was saying. Y'all are not the same guys. What happened to you guys? They marveled. They were amazed, all right? And I believe we as Christians should have that kind of effect on society. And it says, And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the church, they conferred with themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, a notable miracle has been done through them, is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Isn't that funny? They, they want to lie about it. They want to say, make up stuff, but they can't even do that because they knew this guy and everybody there knew this guy. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them. Notice the words, severely threaten them. That now, uh, that from now on, they speak no man to no man in this name. Have you noticed they wouldn't even say the name Jesus? Okay, that's, that's how much they... They didn't like him and did, did not, I mean, you know, they would not recognize Jesus for who he was. So they called them and commanded them. Notice the wording, commanded, threatened, severely, not to speak or to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. And, and that's a nice way of saying, hey, you think what you want to think, Okay. For we cannot but speak of the things which we have seen and we have heard. Folks, they did hang around Jesus. They did see Jesus' miracle. They did see his life and, and what he stood for. And they knew. I mean, a couple of weeks ago we talked about, you know, uh, Peter and, you know, making the statement, you know, who, who am I? And he simply, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old, whom this miracle of healing had been performed. So even though there was fear of persecution, all right, Jesus steps on the scene and he says, peace be still. But the reason I... God gave you this second scripture is because, folks, I'm telling you, when you have a close encounter with Jesus, your life will change, okay? And that's, that's part of that sanctification. That's part of growing in the Lord. I hope I am closer to Christ than I was five years ago. 
I'm, I hope I'm closer to Christ than I was five months ago. All right? There's that process that we go through. And, and while it started out as fear, Jesus made them understand, hey, peace be still. Now look in verse 20 in our text. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So they wanted to see, to believe, and Jesus, you know, he, he said, okay, you guys got to, you know, you, you don't just believe my word or you don't believe, you know, Mary, and, and you don't believe that it's really me. Let me show you. And folks, when they saw Jesus, the scars and all, uh, all they, they, they did believe. Second thing, not only the fear of persecution, the filling of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. Why does somebody repeat the very same thing? Folks, it's for emphasis. It's for emphasis. I'm, I'm still sure, uh, you know, one or two of them were just thinking, you know, who, you know, I know who this is, but, you know, are we imagining this? Are we, we are in a dream? Are we all in a trance? Or, you know, he had to say that because there was still some doubt in that room. All right? So Jesus said, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So what was he doing? Jesus was not just calming them down. Jesus was trying to get them out of that room, to get them out of hiding, to make them understand, listen, I'm dead. All right, though you see me right now, I am alive. But what he literally is doing is commissioning them. He's saying, I can't do this anymore. I'm not going to preach another sermon. I'm not going to do another miracle. But I have something for you to do. And that commissioning uh, we can find in two places. Look at Acts chapter 1. Acts 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The Bible says, and this is Jesus' word, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, on you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Notice the word shall there. Okay? And we do know that, you know, just you know, a few pages over and just a few days later. Uh, the day of Pentecost happened, okay? And the Holy Spirit comes down. We understand uh, in Acts chapter 2 what had happened. But Jesus was commissioning them even before that. They were going to be the first ones, all right, uh, to be spokespersons for Jesus and what, who he was and what he was about. Then in Matthew chapter 28, Matthew 28, we know this scripture, but I, wanna, I want you to see it again. Verse 18, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. And folks, I'm just telling you, you know, he, Jesus was in creation. We, need, we know that God and Jesus was the same. Well, we know that Jesus had control over things when he was here on earth. I mean, he could move fish around. All right, you know, he could cast out demons. There were just so many things. And Jesus said, listen, I was in charge. I'm still in charge. I'm just not going to be here. So all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and folks, there it's talking about making disciples. And, uh, you know, that's really what we are about. Uh, we call this the Great Commission. And we are called, all of us are called to do this. Not just staff members. Not, not just professional folks. Uh, if you have been saved, you are to call, uh, you know, you, you're, you're, you are called to be a witness. And it says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And right after salvation, folks, we go into discipleships. That's why we have Sunday school programs. Sunday school is our small group time, okay? And, and it's, it's very, very important uh, that we not just get people saved and not just get people baptized, but that we, that we take the time to disciple them. 
And it says, uh, and lo, I'm with you always. And there's a promise. Folks, we're not doing it on our own. Okay? God is with us. The Holy Spirit is with us. Jesus is just commissioning, you know, all the folks here. It wasn't just the disciples. He was commissioning all Christians in, in this scripture. And Lord, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So you see Jesus commissioning uh, these disciples that was with them. Now notice what, notice what verse 22 says. Uh, uh, this is really, uh, I, I, I went to several commentaries and looked this, and, and this is, uh, probably one of the most confusing, confusing and uh, even in some ways opinionated about this text here. And I'm going to give you my take on it uh, personally. Verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them. Okay, breathed on them. How did mankind begin? Think about it. What did, what did, what did God do? He breathed life into the first man. And that, that's the physical part of that. But here was the spiritual side of that. And he said unto them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't think this was a special thing that only happened to them. I mean, obviously later on, there were, I mean, when people get saved, you know, they, the, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. We know that at the point of salvation. It was just the first time, it was just that chosen few. Not that they were elite or super spiritual. Because like I said earlier, even being disciples, even being apostles, they did some boneheaded things. Peter especially. Peter usually spoke first and then, uh, you know, had to either be corrected or change his attitude at times. But this was just a personal time with the disciples to where he... he you know, the, that, that power, that dunamis power was given to them. Now, verse 23, this, and this is the verse that confuses a lot of people. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven then. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And what some people believe, in, and folks, I do not believe this. I do not believe he gave them power to forgive sins. There are people that interpret this scripture that way. Folks, only Jesus can forgive sin. Okay, only God can forgive sin. What I believe he was trying to say was these things, okay, the forgiveness of sin, you need to teach that as you go out and as I am commissioned by you. And folks, it's part of the salvation message is, is what I see it to be, okay? The, the, the forgiveness of sins. It's not that they personally could forgive sin. It's that whoever they are talking to Two, needs the forgiveness of their sins and, and be cleansed from all unrighteousness. So you see there uh, that, that man, man cannot forgive sin, only God and Jesus can do that. And our job is to let people know that their sins can be forgiven. And folks, I will tell you this in a witnessing situation, I have talked to more than one person that said, I don't think God can forgive me of what I did. I have talked to several people like that. And I, I just sat down with them, and you know I go through a list of people in the Bible that he forgave. Okay, He forgave prostitutes. He get, forgave tax collectors. He forgave murderers. I mean, can we not say Moses? <laughs> I mean, he slayed a guy. And so it's so important here that they understand and and he's saying that's truly, to me what they're saying, Jesus is saying, this is the gospel message. You can't, no matter how bad you are, no matter what you've done, if you repent of your sins, you can be forgiven. And folks, I've seen uh, jailhouse testimonies like that. I've heard testimonies like that, that they, they were just bound under the weight of God will never forgive me for what I've done. But I'm telling you, if they have a true experience with Jesus, which, again, they're having another one with Jesus uh, at this particular time. So we see the fear of persecution. We see the filling of the Spirit. And we see faith instead of fear. Now Thomas, called the twin, verse 24, 
one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said unto them, Unless I see, notice the wording, in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Well, we all know how Thomas got tagged somewhere. What is his name? Doubting Thomas. All right? And folks, there's probably, uh, there's probably times in our lives that we have all doubted something. Okay? Uh, sometimes it happens when we need a miracle and, and, and we're praying the right words, but we're just in our minds, and in, even maybe in our subconscious, we're thinking, you know, this is not going to happen. This is not going to No matter how bad I want it to happen, this is not going to happen. And here's the key to this. Uh, I've, I've really pondered this, and, and I've really thought about this, uh, not just for a few days. I've always thought the difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt says, I cannot believe. I'm trying to believe, but I cannot believe. Unbelief says, I will not believe. And what did Jesus get on the disciples about? O oh, ye of little faith. And he was just basically saying, man, your faith is small. All right, you're not, you're not trusting like you should. You're not believing what you should. Okay, because we'll say it. We'll say, and we'll even quote the verse, uh, all, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, we'll say nothing is impossible without God, but yet when we get in impossible situations, we doubt. doesn't mean that we're not saved. It just simply means we are not living by faith. And I had a guy tell me one time about living by faith. Whose faith is it, yours or mine? All right? And they tie spirituality with faith. And folks, you should never get caught in the, you know, who's more spiritual than... Folks, I'm just telling you, we, nobody adds up to Jesus. And his whole teaching, and, and if you just think of all the things the disciples went through with him, feeding the 5,000, Jesus knew that they're going to say, that can't be done. There's no stores out here. We can't afford that much food. But what was he teaching them? He was teaching them faith. Okay? And boy, I just cannot tell you how important it is that we as Christians live by faith. Okay? By faith. Faith is, is believing, folks. Faith is trusting. Faith is believing, not just saying God can do anything, but believing God can do anything. And, and that's what he is trying to get them to understand. And Thomas just says, basically, I mean... He didn't call the disciples liars, but he sure, he basically said, I'm not going to believe it. Till I see it, I'm not going to believe it. And then verse 26, this is a week later, all right? And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. And Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst of them. You know, Jesus could have opened the door and went in if he wanted to. But Jesus is a whole lot smarter than we are. And do you know why? He says, I'm going to show, I'm going to, and he wasn't showing off, folks. He was just Jesus. He was in that spirit form. So he just walked. I mean, whether you say walk through a door or, and, and, or walk through a wall, Jesus, he could appear, and, and he did that in, in, in the 40 days there. People would see him, and poof, and then he was gone. Okay? That's because he is Jesus. Okay, he was showing, it, it was almost like he's saying, you want a miracle? I'll give you a miracle. And I'm not saying that's, that was the motive for what he was doing, but he was trying to get the disciples to learn, and especially Thomas at this point. Okay, it's not just saying something. It's believing what you say. Because you can pray the right thing, but if you don't believe it in your heart, folks, I'm telling you, you know, a lot of times, it just doesn't happen. It says, and he stood there and said, peace to you. So three times. So Thomas might have, must have had a funny look on his face too, but three times. And folks, what it tells me, 
if, if Jesus is on, is on our side, if the Prince of Peace is in our heart and in our lives, we have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. And folks, the Bible tells us we need that peace that passes all understanding. Because we're going to be faced with things in life, folks. I'm just telling you, there could be uh, terrifying things that happen or something that bad happens to you. And people are watching what you do and watching what you say. And you are going to, whether you know it or not, you're going to show how much faith you have by what you do or by what you say. And as we mature in Christ, all right, we really uh, uh, mature in our prayer lives and mature in in Bible study and reading and, and, and being filled with the Spirit, I'm telling you, we are going to have that peace that passes all understanding. And folks, the, the world doesn't understand that, okay? I mean, I've been, I've been to, I couldn't even tell you how many funerals I've been to. I can't even tell you how many funerals I've preached in 43 years of ministry. But I'm simply saying there are people there that just, they are, you know, they just, uh, don't believe they they just have this fear I, i'll never see them and they have this you know about death and things they just you know they just fall apart just totally and folks i i'm not you can grieve you can cry I, there's nothing wrong with grieving jesus wept at a lazarus deal okay but to to just have that no hope and you know it's lost it's gone and all this we should not be that way as christians our faith should sustain us during these times. And we have examples in our own church of, of, uh, of death to where even, even parents, all right? I mean, uh, Landon and Missy, I, I, we walked through that, and I am telling you, it, they, they amazed me, amazed me at, of how much faith and how much belief and how much trust they had. In, in losing Lele. So it says, verse 27, and he said to Thomas, reach your finger in here and look at my hands and reach your hand in here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. What is he saying? You want proof? And really, Jesus didn't owe, owe him that proof. He didn't have to do what he did. Mr. Doubting Thomas, he says, you need proof? And folks, it's just like people just say, well, I don't believe in God at all. And uh, Scott still is one of the best gospel teachers, gospel preachers, uh, gospel witnesses. I, and, and, you know, I've, I've been with him and I've watched him in action. And he goes, he doesn't go back to creation as much. You know, he, he'll use the world. He'll use the galaxies. He'll use things that happen in life, just everyday life. Do you think that just happened? You see, and it, it's so logical, and, and, and that's what uh, he was trying to get Thomas to understand. You know, you, you have to trust me. You, you have to believe. If you don't believe, we've got a problem here, okay? And that's, that's why he says, do not be unbelieving, but believing. Then verse 28, and Thomas answered and hit, answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Just that it's it's almost like the statement that Peter made. Okay, thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter got it way before Thomas. And you know, you can say what you want, folks. There are late bloomers. Uh, there are people that don't get it the first or second or third time. All right? But at this point in Thomas's life, I mean, to make a statement like that, it was like the light came on. He knew what he was saying. He knew uh, what what he needed to do, and he made that de decorate, decoration of faith. In verse 29, and he said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. And it, it almost, you know, that statement there, we thought, you know, hey, you saw me and you believe that this is the statement uh, that should have been cutting or really made Thomas think about it. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. 
and I've said this many times to y'all, think about this. We, as Christians, and in the day in which we live, we are looking back at the cross, and we have seen that happen in, in history, and we can even see it happen uh, from a secular point of view or from a book point of view or from history point of view. Even though we know that Jesus Christ was the, was the Messiah, the people in the Old Testament had to look forward and had to look forward to something that had not even happened. Jesus wasn't even on the radar. He wasn't even born. Okay? There was 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yet those by faith, by faith. And turn to Hebrews 11 with me. Hebrews 11. I know you've heard this, but we need, we need to repeat. We need repetition because we say we have faith, but do we really have faith? Hebrews 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. And again, you know, don't, don't get tripped up on the word hope. Well, I hope so. For instance, you know, I, I was trained in evangelism explosion, and one of the, word, the questions we asked, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? And I couldn't tell you how many times in Lawton, where I grew up, they said, well, I hope so. And my deal was, you hope so? You're talking about all of eternity, and we're sitting here talking about, I hope I'm saved? And then, it, I'm just telling you, it was like reeling in fish sometimes. It, they, it just, something came on in their mind. Folks, is Jesus coming again? Well, I hope so. <laughs> Folks, he's coming. Whether you are ready or whether you believe it or not, he's coming. We're, that, we're in Revelation. I don't know how anybody could sit through Revelation and not want to be saved if they were lost. I just don't get it, okay? Because it's real. This is not a fictitious book, all right? It's not just a book of symbols and figurative language, all right? It's what's going to happen. Already, I've had two people in the office look at my title and just say, where did you get that? I said, out of my head. Sunday, my title is Hell on Earth. I'm telling you, when that fifth uh, trumpet ha happens, it's going to be hell on you just I'm just telling you, hang on, you're going you're gonna to hear about it. And it's real, folks. This is, not a, this is not a video game, all right? So faith is a substance of things hopeful for the evidence of things not seen. So do we have to see it to believe it? Well, as Christians, we shouldn't. Hey, have you seen God? No. Have you talked to God? No. I mean, literally talked to God. No. But yet you serve a God that you've never seen and you've never talked to? That's faith. That's faith. Now look at verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible. Will somebody underline that in their Bible? <laughs> somebody underline that. You cannot. You will not. You will not. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God, look at this word, must believe. It didn't say believe. You must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently, diligently seek him. And folks, I am telling you, I can't tell you how many times people have gotten bad news and usually the bad news, and I'm just using an illustration, I found out I got cancer. And I know some people that almost stopped living. They did not have joy anymore. They did not have, you know, uh, the, that abundant life. Why? Because, man, something bad happened to them. And folks, bad things happen to good people so that people can see all things work together for good to those who are called according to God's purpose. Romans 8, 28. And we quote that, but do we really believe it? We must believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I've told you all, all along, I had cancer when I was 30 years old, and uh, I get checked every year for cancer. And I probably, my guess is, it just gets dormant in you. And I, I, I think, you know, if my lungs don't get me, cancer will probably get me. But I will tell you this, I will keep preaching as long as I can walk up them steps, I will keep preaching till the day I die. All right? Am I going to take chemo? Uh, it depends on 
If I get much older, I'm going to say no. All right? But I'm still saying, folks, death does not scare me. Why? Because my faith is in the one who created me. My faith is in God. And if God lets me live, I mean, I just turned 65 years old. And I would already say, honestly, I, I feel like I've lived a great life. Just a wonderful life. I don't have a death wish. Don't go crazy on me here. All right? But I'm just saying, you know, must believe. In the last one, Matthew, 7, Matthew uh, 17. Matthew 17, verse 20. And you remember, the boy, a boy is healed here, and uh, he just asked, you know, he was just talking about them, and he said, you know, your disciples couldn't heal them. All right? You know, you know what's the deal? Are they not disciples? Aren't they who they say they are? And look at verse 20. So Jesus, well, look at 19. Then disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. Your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have the faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move here, uh, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. Now, is Jesus wanting us to have such faith that we're going to chunk mountains into water and do things like that? Folks, that's not the point. We all have mountains in our lives. We all have things that we don't think we can do. It's like I've talked to people, I'm telling you sometimes till I'm blue in the face, I can't witness. <laughs> really. Even though God told you to do it, you can't do it. Folks, I understand shy, I understand personalities, but I do not believe a person cannot witness. I just don't believe that. All right? And I understand they'll even say, well, I'm a silent witness. I don't have, hey, I'm glad you're living for Jesus, but it's a lot better if you open your mouth and say it. Okay? And what I'm saying, there are mountains in your life. That may be your mountain. Okay? You say you have faith, you say you believe, then start sharing. That's that's just one example. But verse 21, however, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Folks, seeing is believing, I understand. In like, you know, what is it, Missouri, the show me state? Well, folks, I'm telling you, God has shown himself all around you. God has shown himself in your life, in your family's life, in your job. He just he has shown in creation. Okay, he has shown himself. He don't have to show us. But believing is basically saying, I know God can do all things. You see, it's not me. Even that verse, we, we, we quote the verse, I can do all things through Christ who, speak, who strengthens me. But sometimes we emphasize, I. Well, I got news for you. You can't do everything. There's some things, I'm telling you, you have to have Christ to do you have to have God in you, okay? He allows you, he helps you do these things. And believing, the second part of that is trusting in God's timing. There are a lot of folks that fall short of believing because you're not doing it on God's, God's time. And there are people, I'm telling you, they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they quit praying. They quit praying because God didn't answer their prayer when they wanted it answered. Okay? And, and Jesus is here just basically saying, it's more than seeing is believing. It's believing is seeing. And folks, we've seen God, God all around us, and I pray that we will be true believers. Father, thank you for the day, and thank you for just your word. Thank you for examples uh, like Peter. Lord, he messed up many times. And, Thomas here was called Downey Thomas, and these are guys close to Jesus. And uh, God, I thank you that we have nothing to fear. And God, I pray that we would replace our fear with faith. God, I pray that we would just put our trust in you. And God, I pray that you would just continue to do a work in our lives. And God, I pray, and, and I know we're already filled with the Spirit, but Lord, if we have mountains uh, and we, we just feel like we can't do something, God, I pray that we would just go to you and ask for your help and make it a matter of prayer. And, and even the, the spiritual thing of fasting, 
I hear very little of that going on around. And God, that's just that's that's the deep spiritual things in life. And so God, just be with us as we as we believe and as we show people Jesus. And God, I pray that you would, just like Peter and John, give us give us that boldness that people would just say, Wow, wow. Now that is a Christian. And God, we will give you the honor and the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.